Hi there, folks, and welcome to our uh, Bible study. We've taken a couple of weeks off, but we're here getting started. And by a request from some of you online, we're going to start in the book of Revelation today. It's an interesting book, a fascinating book, and a book that requires us to put our thinking caps on because it's quite unlike um, anything else, really, in Scripture. But as always, to, uh, before we open up God's word, we're going to open with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for bringing us together this day, here in person or online. We pray that you would open our eyes to your word. We pray that you would enable us and allow us to um, think critically about this book, this um, wonderful treasure that you have given your church and you have given your people, um, allow it to uh, increase and to build up our faith and, uh, and let its lessons for the church back 2,000 years ago be applicable for us today. Be with us and guide us always in Christ's name. Amen. We are going to start before we give some background introduction in the book by reading the, uh, just the prologue to the book, the first, the first three verses, and uh, that'll give away the uh, name of the book, part of its purpose, and then we're going to talk about um, literary genre in the Bible, why um, uh, some things, uh, what some various types of books in the Bible are, and uh, we will go from there. So, um, uh, Daphne, would you please take the first three verses here? In yep, yep, the first three verses. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very, very much. Um, we get the name of the book from the first, from, well, the second word here, Revelation, one word in Greek. Now, the Greek word here is uh, quite interesting. Um, the Greek word here is apocalypsis. Sounds like apocalypse, right? And indeed, that's what it is. So if you look at older translations and older, um, and older editions of the English language Bibles, this book will be called the Apocalypse of St. John. Uh, Revelation is another uh, translation of it, but we get the word apocalypse in our modern sense from this book. And all the, um, the crazy stuff that we think of when we think of apocalypse it's gotten from a reading of this book. And indeed, that kind of lays the ground of what a popular understanding of the book of Revelation is. Doom and gloom and end times and crazy things. And indeed, we do see some of that. But to really interpret this book well, I think we need to take a step back and look at it within the context of the rest of Scripture. And indeed, think about how we actually read God's word and how we interpret it. So, we know there are 66 books in the Bible, right? From Genesis to Revelation. And each of those 66 books can be subcategorized into a certain, certain genre of literature. So, we don't read um, Stephen King the way we read a nonfiction book. Right? We don't read, um, oh, I, I, we don't read a romance novel the way we read um, a commentary on scripture. Different types of books call for it to be written in a different way. Now, if you look at a, a, a work of fiction, um, uh, let's just take The Great Gatsby, for example, the classic F. Scott Fitzgerald novel. He uses a lot of uh, figurative language, a lot of illusion, a lot of hidden things in the text, even like color. So Fitzgerald will say that something is blue, and that will hint at the mood that he wants the reader to, um, the reader to get here. So we read different types of books, different ways depending on their genre. 
fiction versus nonfiction, mystery, um, uh, drama, whatever the case may be. In the same way we, we read scripture differently, different books differently, depending on the type of, of genre that it is. We've got a number of genres in uh, scripture. History, poetry, prophecy, the gospels stand on their own in their own category, and letters, epistles. We don't read them all the same way. For example, we don't read the book of Psalms like we read the gospels. The book of Psalms, they are poetic. They're using figurative, beautiful language designed to enhance our worship of God and designed to, uh, to, to, to draw us into the emotion that David or the other psalmist wants to get across. The same way with the book of Revelation. We are going to see wonderful, beautiful visions that... But we see here the angel, the Greek word for angel, angelos, means messenger, that the angelic messengers gave to John. They're putting things that he could not ever be able to understand in a frame of mind that he could just barely type to grasp. Showing images of what the end of days would look like. But that's only a fraction, mostly showing images of what heaven will look like. The coronation of Christ in heaven, Christ seated on his throne. And it is totally beyond what John, or what we could imagine. So we're going to see things like lions and seals and multi-headed beasts. And sometimes we have a tendency to want to read in to that vision of heaven to things here on earth. I, I mentioned it last week in the sermon. In 2008, people were looking at the Bible, looking at Revelation, and thought, well, my goodness, the election of Barack Obama means we are at the end times. And they tried to make things line up here to events happening now. The same way today. And we can do that, and I think that that's a bad way to read the Bible. Because we're putting our modern day lens and trying to make the Bible fit our events rather than simply letting Scripture speak to us and uh, in letting Scripture say what it wants to say, letting God say what it wants to say. Sometimes we want to make it fit into the news cycle. So we're going to try to avoid that as we go through this study. We're going to try to avoid matching up this verse with this event. We're simply going to let Scripture speak. And if something with current events comes up, we'll talk about it. But I think we make a mistake if we read Revelation the same way we read the Gospels. The Gospels are a blow-by-blow -blow look at the life of Jesus Christ. They are 100% true, 100% historically grounded. You could go back, if you could travel in time, you could go back in time and match each verse of the Gospels with something that happened in Jesus' life. Revelation is different. We shouldn't read it in the same way. But nevertheless, just because not everything in Revelation is hyper-literal does not mean it's not true. It is still 100% true. It is still 100% God's word. We simply read it in its different context and in its different genre. Any discussion on this thus far? I'm, I'm sorry, could you? Yeah. Yeah, and so that, 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 that gives us into a bit of a background of why this book, why, why God, why God sent his angelic messengers to John to give him these visions. This was written in about AD 90, 90 AD. Um, so several years after Jesus was born, John, the last of Jesus' disciples, was still living. Um, and... The church, the fledgling Christian church, was in a great deal of persecution then. 
part of the reason for the writing of this book was to comfort the church. That's why it starts out with these letters to seven churches that were going through persecution. There, it's, no, it's, it's no accident that that's how this book starts, with seven letters to seven different churches, all going through their own trials. John makes sure to, and, and, and God makes sure to lay out the fact, lay out to them the fact that, uh, that this book is for them. This book is meant to challenge them, to give them comfort. And some of the very scary things that you mention um, are really meant for their ears. Their ears who are going through persecution from Nero, later persecution from uh, Diocletian and others. Um, and that book is, and this book is in part meant to comfort them. And today, as the church goes through increased persecution, not only around the world, but also here at home, we can take comfort from this as well, just as they did many years ago. Thanks for raising that. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, the, these these things these things will come to pass. Um, we trust that they will come to pass in God's time rather than their own. That's why we get so many occasions and so many so many people who will obsess over this book and will try to make everything in the news cycle fit in here, everything in here, and that that's simply not the case. Sometimes. Events happen, and yeah, God is in control, but not every event has to do with this book. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's, what, that's what I'm trying to get across here. I think if we were to be faithfully reading this, we need to avoid a, um, an interpretation fallacy called uh, eisegesis. That is overly reading our own experiences and our own situation into the words of the text rather than letting the text speak to our situation. So where is our starting point in biblical interpretation? Is it with us and our situation and our events, or is it with God's word? And when we start with God's word, we can avoid some of the crazy interpretations of this book that are out there. It, 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 it's, 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 it's not a new approach, but it's something that I think, I think can help us. Because, because as, as I said, we don't read the Psalms the same way that we read the Gospels. So we shouldn't read this the same way that we read them either. It's 100% true, but that doesn't mean that everything in here is 100% literal to our situation now. Now in the far future, perhaps, but again, John is looking at this with sort of these, he's getting God's message to him, but he's looking at this with sort of um, clouded glasses too. Because in the same way that in the Old Testament, man could not look upon the glory of God and live, so God appeared through various different means, the burning bush, a very um, salient example. In the same way, there are things, heaven and this vision is going to be so much more glorious than even Revelation, than even Revelation describes. Revelation describes great glory, but it's going to be 
better. And it's going to be more amazing and more awesome and more beyond our description. We see a little taste here. We get a little taste in worship too. But what we will see is all the more glorious here too. So, yeah. No, 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 totally, totally. That's, that's why we're doing this. And um, there's, there's sort of this, this meme at seminary where the first Bible study a pastor always wants to do is the book of Revelation. And that's why I've waited for over nearly two years to do it. Because you need to be prepped and ready to look at this book. Because it's, it's, it's not like opening up the Gospels with this blow-by-blow, station-by-station thing. You need to be prepped and ready and ready to study. So that's where we're at. Lynn, we're in Revelation chapter 1. Um, but we're going to skip ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're finally... And, and, I, and I hope Mrs. Brown is watching online because I know that you've wanted to do, um, that you've wanted to do this book. So uh, I hope that you're watching with us online and, and I know that you've got Sunday school duties to do, but this is online too. So if you want to go and watch, you're welcome to do so. Um, so we, a couple of months ago, I think before our judges study, we looked at these messages to the seven churches. So we've already done that, so we are going to skip over this. But before we do, I just want to draw into mind, in, in what I said here, um, it's important to uh, recognize that this book is written to them, first and foremost. It's written to us as well, but the primary original audience was to these seven churches that were going through persecution. The book of Revelation was meant to comfort these churches as they go through persecution. It wasn't meant to scare them or terrify them. It was meant to comfort them. This book is also meant to comfort us. Although if you just go straight through it, you're not going to see how. So let's go ahead to uh, chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. And for those watching online, you can go back on this YouTube channel and look for um, this study. And you can uh, go back and watch those. It was about a four-week study on the seven churches there. So Revelation chapter 4, um, let's do verses 1 through 6. Lynn, would you please take verses 1 through 6? Thank you very much. Um, so the prologue of this book had finished. Those are the introductions to the seven different churches. That's written. John wrote that. John, John recorded that. It's good. There's one other thing I want to just remember. At the very beginning today, we mentioned that um, blessed are those who read this book aloud. Originally, scripture was not read like a book because people couldn't read I mean, as it, you go back only uh, less than 100 years in this country, and the vast majority of people here couldn't read. So they got to know God by hearing the word. And so we are indeed continuing that tradition as we speak the word aloud to each other. Let's um, go here. Note the invitation here. Note the voice and the invitation. The voice here, in general, is uh, Jesus. When you hear the voice, this divine voice in the book of Revelation, that is Christ. It is Christ who is beckoning and inviting John 
to uh, come up, to come up here. I'll show you what must take place after this. So it is, it is Christ who is inviting John to get further and deeper into this narrative. Um, and uh, John isn't going alone. I find this incredibly comforting and wonderful. Verse 2 here. At once I was in the Spirit. The purpose, or one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit is to um, guide us as we read God's word. John had a guide as he went on this, as he had these, these vision experiences. And that guide is the same guide that we have when we open up God's word. That guide is the Holy Spirit. And I think when we uh, let the Spirit be our guide, rather than let ourselves, again, try to read our own experiences, let God speak to us, we will do so well as we read these tough parts of Scripture. So, now we get um, interesting... This, 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 this is, as he was saying, this is the beautiful part of the book right here. Um, precious, precious things. Jasper and carnelian, rainbow that had an appearance of an emerald. This is a key here, too that had the appearance of. So was it actually an emerald? Was it actually jasper? Well, probably not, because those are very earthbound things that God created. Heavenbound things that God created, because God also created this, um, are going to be more glorious. But again, this is all framed within John's own perception here. I want to note also verse 4, because this is going to be key, very crucial as we get into this book. 24 thrones, 24 elders. When you see a number in the book of Revelation, any number in the book of Revelation, stop and think about that number. Because I guarantee you, every number in the book of Revelation has symbolism. It has truth, but it may not be literally true. It may be symbolically true, as we will see later on. Now, right here, there's no reason that we shouldn't interpret this as literally true, but it has symbolism. 24 divided into is 12. 12 is a key number in Scripture because it refers to the 12 tribes of Israel and Judah, the 12 disciples. Absolutely. So this is symbolic here because it plays to that illusion of the 12 tribes, the 12 disciples, but it brings it to completion. When you double something in Scripture, it is usually brought to a degree of completion. So this, whereas the 12 tribes of Israel were, um, was the imperfect, incomplete uh, thing, and the twelve disciples, imperfect and complete, here in heaven it is brought to completion and it is brought to resolution. Hence why we see the number 24 here. Twelve tribes, those were God's people. Twelve disciples, those were God's people. It is God's people who surrounds the throne. Surrounds the throne in an exalted and a glorified uh, me, state. Um, I will read um, the, the commentary here. Representatives of the 12 tribes of Israel plus the 12 apostles of Jesus. Together they represent all God's people from both Old Testament and New Testament times. So, go to, um, if you go to verse 5. We see other numbers here. Seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Seven is another key number in Scripture. Seven is a number of uh, completion here. Um, so these, uh, I'm, I'm going to read from the commentary again here too because it does a good job. Throughout Scripture, the number seven symbolizes completeness. Accordingly, the seven churches earlier on may represent the whole Christian church on earth and the challenges those churches face. 
the seven torches of fire, the seven spirits of God, the torches are the church of God. The church, the individual churches, the congregations, because it is through the church, through the gathered assembly of believers, that the flame of God's word continues forward and goes forth. It's through the church that God's word is proclaimed, like a torch in the night. The spirits of God, spirit there, not in capital letters here, referring to, um, uh, referring to the message, referring to, uh, again, this, this notion of carrying it forth. And so not only the individuals of the Christian church are gathered around God's throne, but also the assemblage of believers gathered around God's throne. And this is a difficult concept for us to maybe grasp because we separate the individual from the group. An individual cannot be part of the group if they are standing separate from it. But nevertheless, here around the throat of God, the individual is there and the group is there simultaneously. Um, it's an interesting uh, thing here. Any discussion on this? Did I explain this clearly? I don't know, because this is a challenging, challenging book. But, but you're seeing the key point for these first six verses, your take-home point. God's people are gathered around God's throne. The people of God are there, and they are in heaven. And that should bring us hope as we go through our challenges in life. So, uh, Amy, would you please take uh, this to the end of chapter 4, to the end of the chapter? Uh, start, start at verse, actually at the back half of verse 6, and around the throne. So we see a couple of things here, things of some symbolism, but some literalness. Um, first we see these four living creatures, like a lion, like an ox, the face of a man, like an eagle in flight. So in a traditional Christian artwork, the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are represented in this. Matthew, um, like a lion, Mark, like an ox, Luke, like a man, and John, like an eagle. That's an artwork, but I don't think that that is a faithful reading of this text. Um, question is, what are these creatures? Um, Ezekiel, early on, describes um, cherubim in a similar way. 
angelic beings, created beings that serve God in heaven. We don't really see here. The point here is to show that um, it is not only what we saw before, mankind, all humanity, was there in heaven with God, but also all of God's creation gathered there, including these um, heavenly beings. But note what takes primacy. It is man that's there. It is man that takes primacy. It is mankind that is mentioned first, human beings. We are the apex of God's creation, not these angelic beings. They are servants of God. We are also servants of God, but we are created in his image. So this should bring us some degree of comfort, too, um, that, that we are there in the midst of this and that we take primacy over these creatures. Now, we see here two hymns, two songs that were being sung. We sing them too. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. The Sanctus is taken from here. In our liturgy, we sing these words that one day we will sing in heaven. It's another um, song, um, uh, verse 11. Um, we hear this more... Um, spelled out a little later, this is the uh, Agnus uh, Dei, worthy are you, but we see a little bit later, worthy is the Lamb. So we, um, uh, we sing these hymns, these are part of our liturgy, these are part of our hymnody. So we see this heavenly worship described in verses 9 and 10. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O God. Um, all the glory that we will have, that we will be given in heaven, we still cast it before our creator, before our God. This is a wonderful reference to um, why we do it. For you, for God, you created all things, and by your will, they existed and were created. People who say, there are lots of people who say that uh, God didn't create the world, that it happened by chance. Scripture is unequivocal on this. God created all that exists. From him, by his will, they were created and indeed are being created. Now, something here that, um, uh, that happens here, and this is an open question, is heaven like this every day, every moment, all the time? Is this featuring the coronation of the Lamb? These are open questions here. That's something that I think we have to understand with the book of Revelation. There are lots of open questions. There are lots of things that we don't have the answer to. And we need to be okay with not having the answer to all these things. To simply let Scripture speak to us. And where we don't know, well, when we gather here around this throne, we will know. Any discussion on this thus far? All right, let's press on to chapter 5. One of the things I like about, these, um, about this book, at least um, early on, and really continuing, uh, these chapters are relatively, um, are relatively short. So they're, uh-oh, lost my place, so they are somewhat manageable. I'm going to read this here before we do. So John describes the heavenly worship he saw in the Lord's throne room where all the saints and angels adore the Lord. Regular worship is a serious matter required by one of the Ten Commandments and described as the activity of heaven. Sadly, many people do not even feel a twinge of conscience when skipping worship. Even while presence, they may fail to focus on the promised blessing in such services. Yet Jesus continues to call us back to his presence. In fact, his forgiveness and promise of eternal life is the first order of business in worship. This is key to the situation that we find ourselves in as we crawl our way back from COVID. 
And we are seeing more and more people return to worship, even here at Resurrection, and we're glad about that. But nevertheless, there are a lot of people who have not returned to worship. Worship is not optional for the Christian. Worship is not optional, it is commanded. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And it's what we will be doing on into eternity. And we miss out when we get to do it in the here and now. Worship is not optional for the Christian. Certainly not optional in heaven. So let's continue. Um, I'll read here. Actually, Lynn, would you please take verses 1 through 5? The scroll of the Lamb. Then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming him with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth is able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has conquered, so that he can open the scroll in his seven seals. Thank you very much. This is where we have to think literal versus symbolic. Are they talking about a literal paper scroll here, or is that language symbolic? I think it is here symbolic. Scroll in scripture, or we'd say a book now, because we don't have scrolls. A book is not about a book in and of itself. The purpose of a book is what's contained inside the book. So the purpose is not here of opening a scroll, but it is what is inside the scroll, what is inside the box. The answer here is salvation. Why does John weep when a scroll can't be opened? Not a big deal. Someone can't open a book, whatever. But the message inside the scroll is the message of salvation. So when he saw that this scroll could not be opened, he thought, well, there's no salvation for us here. And in this moment, that's why he wept. Because there was no salvation. However, one of the elders, those are one of the people redeemed by the message in that scroll, said, Weep no more. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, is conquered. So they can open up the scroll and its seven seals. Now, is Jesus literally a lion? No, this is symbolic language. But the symbolism is heightened here when talking about the root of David. Because the root of a plant is what comes before the plant. Right? I, um, uh, I had an onion in my kitchen that I had forgotten for a little bit, and then it started sprouting. I put it in the ground. Hopefully I'll have some onions to grow. The root comes before the rest of the plant. The bulb of the onion comes before the rest of the plant. However, Jesus Christ is not only the descendant of David, but he is at the very root of David. That's, how, that's, that's the deep symbolism here. It, sh it is focused not so much on current events, and again, not on like looking and trying to make the news fit the book of Revelation, but it is all focused on Christ. That's the key to understanding this book. Christ is at the very root of all of this. So, Amy, would you please take verses 6 through 10? 6 through 10.
And then just one more verse, please. Oh, no, no, you're good, you're good. Yeah, just, just verse 10. Awesome, thank you. Um, the lamb here, I think you know, it's Jesus, absolutely. The lamb here is referring to... Hi there. The lamb is referring here to uh, Jesus Christ. That's a common theme, a common motif in Scripture, Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, represented here in an entirely different way. Saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Scars its hands and feet and side. Maybe not there on this lamb, but scars nonetheless. This language is here potentially literal, potentially symbolic. Could in this moment Jesus be in the form of a lamb? Perhaps. Could he be in the form of a man? Perhaps, but again, you'll remember, John is seeing this through sort of this clouded vision. He's seeing this in terms of prophecy and in terms of, uh, and in terms of apocalypse. So um, it's good and it's crucial here to, uh, to remember the point is that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God, that sacrificial lamb, the one all-availing sacrifice for all people from all times. For those 12 and 12 elders, the tribes of Israel, the disciples, all the saints, all the people of God. Incense, they're holding their prayers. Incense is used in many churches to accompany prayer. Psalms say, let my prayer rise before you as incense, lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. This is an allusion to an Old Testament and even a modern practice of prayer. The prayers are there, and the prayers of the people are one and the same, always. Save us. Save us, good Lord. Hosanna. Save us. And that prayer is answered as the scroll is opened, the story of salvation. For it is Christ, through his all-availing sacrifice for us, that is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. He was slain by his blood. This is such a wonderful hymn here. By his blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you've made them a kingdom and priests to our God. All people have access to God as priests. So the prayers go right up as incense. You don't need to go through a priest. All people have access to God for priests. And they shall reign on the earth. This is where the now of the book hits, because Revelation is not just of the future, it is also about the now. And the now hits right here. The now hits right here because we are saved. We are beneficiaries of the work of the Lamb on the cross. That's crucially important to consider. Uh, any discussion on this thus far? Let's move on. Lynn, would you please take verses 11 through 14? Yeah. And then I looked and I heard around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, the voice of the many angels, numbering periods of periods and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, and who is the power of God, and wisdom and might, and honor and glory, and in blessings. And I heard every It's all about the Lamb. It's all about Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Worthy is the Lamb who is slain. Handel set this to music in the Messiah. We um, sing it also. How interesting, the story of salvation. Adam and Eve fell into sin. A lamb was sacrificed on their behalf. Cain killed Abel. 
Abel had offered sacrifices of lamb. Noah, Abraham, Moses, the Passover, lambs, the blood of lambs spread on the doorpost to save the people from their sin. David sinned, sacrificed a lamb. Then you go forward to the banks of the Jordan. John was there preaching and he saw a man in the distance and said, Look, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And even in heaven, the story of salvation comes to its completion. As he opens that seal of salvation for all time. And the four living creatures said, Amen. Amen, let it be so. And they fell down and worshipped. Any discussion on this? Mm-hmm. Pastor, this feels like uh, to me, you know, when we say the Trinity, yeah. God, yeah. especially if the uh, 13th and him who sits on the throne, yeah. And, and this is this is interesting here. Verse, um, yeah, verse, there's verse um, to him who sits on the throne that is God the Father. The Lamb is the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You remember is John's guide throughout this. This is a triune book. The Trinity is here in these pages. So that's a really great thing to point out here. Absolutely, thank you. And it, the Trinity is glorious and mystical, and we celebrate Trinity Sunday in three weeks. So we'll talk more about it then. (laughs) Any further discussion on this today? So next week we will continue with chapters 6 and going forward. But for now, let's close in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for um, the Lamb. Thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to be that all-availing sacrifice for our sins. As we continue our study through this book, help us to realize that you, O Lord, are the star here. That Christ is the focus of this book as he is throughout scripture. Be with us and guide us this day. Bless us in our worship. In Christ's name, amen. Lord, bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. See you down the line soon. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.